Hi everyone and welcome to our event, LGBTQIA plus history, lawbreakers and society shakers. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion, particularly after History Month last month in the UK and International Women's Day just a few weeks ago. These are the types of discussions we should be having and we will be having all year round, not just on History Months or Pride Months. Just to introduce myself, I'm Saha Jamfa. My pronouns are she, her, and I've worked in the corporate comms and public relations department at Sage Publishing. But outside of that, I'm also part of our employee-led LGBTQIA plus group at Sage. And for those who may not be aware of us, Sage is a global academic publisher of books, journals, and a growing suite of library products and services. We've been part of the global academic community since 1965, supporting quality research that transforms society and our understanding of individuals, groups, and cultures. So following on from LGBTQIA plus History Month last month, a group of us from different parts of SAGE came together and recognized a need for an external event that allows experts to discuss the historical and cultural impact of UK legislation on the LGBTQIA plus community. So I reached out to our panel today due to their expertise and research, and I'm really excited to have them here today in this discussion. And we'll obviously be introducing them more formally um, as soon as possible. Just to say that unfortunately, Natasha Kennedy could no longer join us, but we're really thrilled to have author Meg John Barker on the panel. And over the course of LGBTQIA plus History Month, We've had a number of internal events led by our partnered organization Stonewall, such as LGBTQIA plus history and trans liberation. We also have a number of journals, blog posts and previous webinars available to access on our website and social media pages, such as the examples on the slide. And as the year progresses, we're looking forward to being able to host events such as this in person, but we'll also maintain a hybrid element as well. So I'm now going to pass things on to Stephen Harris, who's news editor at The Conversation and our moderator for today's webinar. Thanks very much, Sal. Um, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, as as Sal said, my name is Stephen Harris. Um, I'm the news editor at The Conversation. Um, I'm also a bisexual man, pronouns he, him. Um, just to give you a bit of background about The Conversation, um, we're the world's largest publisher of original research-based content, but we're also essentially in a news and analysis magazine online um, that's aimed at non-academic general public um, to find, uh, enabling them to kind of find out uh, what's going on in the world today and what the latest research is in lots of different topics, um, all based on the uh, expertise of academics who write our articles for us. Um, so we, we essentially provide a service for academics to be able to reach the, the general public, as well as providing um, a really fantastic website for people to read. Um, if we can just skip to the next slide, perhaps to cycle through. Um, we're essentially a collaboration between academics and journalists. So um, we talk to academics, find out what um, they can, uh, what kind of thoughts and opinions they might have on what's going on in the world right now, um, and work with them to produce articles to explain that to a non academic audience. Um, if you want to cycle through to the next slide. Um, we're actually part of um, uh, we're a global website, essentially. So um, we have a UK based edition that I am the news editor for. So I run the day to day operations of the site. Um, but we have editions uh, in Australia, uh, North America, Africa, uh, Indonesia as well, uh, and France and Spain as well. Uh, and uh, this helps us reach a really, truly international audience. Um, so that's that's my spiel. I, I'll, uh, I'll finish that now. So uh, thank you for listening to that. Um, so now I uh, would love to introduce our panel to you. Um, so first we have Adam Jowett, um, and actually it would be a bit better if uh, I let them introduce themselves. So Adam, do you want to just tell us a bit about yourself? Hi, yes, um, I'm Adam. Thank you for having me. Um, my pronouns are he or him. 
Um, I am an associate head of the School of Psychological, Social and Behavioural Sciences at Coventry University. I'm a social psychologist by background with interests in LGBTQIA plus identities and issues. Um, and I most recently was the lead investigator of the government commissioned research on conversion therapy, um, which they commissioned to help inform their policy. Great, thank you, Adam. Um, Catherine, tell us about yourself. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Catherine Lee, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a Professor of Inclusive Education and Leadership at Anglia Ruskin University. We've got campuses in Chelmsford, in Cambridge and in Peterborough, and of course uh, in London as well. Um, I'm a teacher by background um, and have first-hand experience of teaching during the, uh, the Section 28 era. And um, I, I, some of the work that I do now involves working with schools across the UK um, on leadership development for LGBT um, teachers who wish to become head, head teachers in other, in other senior roles. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, finally, but uh, interestingly, let's have um, Meg John Barker, please tell us uh, a bit about your background. Sure, um, it's lovely to be here. Um, so yeah, I'm a recovering academic. <laughs> so my background's in academia, but I'm now a writer full time. Um, I was also a therapist for a number of years too. And um, I mostly write uh, both comic books and kind of self-help style books around gender, sex and relationship diversity. Um, so that's the, I'm really writing for a general audience now, but based on academic ideas, therapy uh, theories, and also activist ideas um, and creative ideas. And it's really nice to be here because I've published a few books with Sage along the way and also contributed to a couple of their LGBT encyclopedias. So um, Sage has a very fond place in my heart. Great, thank you to uh, all our panelists there for introducing themselves. Um, so as Sahar was talking about the, the kind of starting point for our discussion today is um, some of the historical piece of legislation and, and campaigns that have helped uh, improve um, LGBT plus rights in the UK. But we're also going to talk a bit about why those are relevant topics to talk about today. Um, and also the, the other campaigns that are going on still um, today, what the kind of latest in the um, campaign for rights uh, are for the LGBT plus community, and also looking a bit towards the future uh, and what potential uh, campaigns there might be there, but also potential threats to, to rights as well. Um, so going to start by going back in time a little bit um, to um, the era of, of section 28. And I'd really like to start by just asking Catherine um, to talk a bit about why um, Section 28 and the, its impact and um, the campaign against it is still relevant for people to know about today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Stephen. Yes, yeah, Section 28 ran for um, 15 long years between 1988 and, um, and 2003. Um, and it it actually applied to local authorities. It was brought in by, um, by the Conservative government under Mrs Thatcher's leadership at the time. And it, it, said, it said many things, but the most, um, the most relevant to our conversation today was that local authorities should not promote homosexuality as a pretended family relationship. Now, um, we'll, we'll, we'll move the, the gobbledygook of pretended family relationship and promoting homosexuality to one side. Um, schools back then, um, state schools, were all under the, um, under the leadership of, of the local authorities. We didn't have academy chains and so on as we, as we did today. So anything that applied to the local authority also applied to, to schools. Um, so, and, and it was one of those really, really vaguely and, and, and strangely worded laws, um, you know, how does one promote homosexuality? Um, homosexuality at the time, um, it was included on the World Health Organization's lists of, of illnesses. So how, how does one promote a, something that is classified as an illness? And, and what is a pretended family relationship? And why 
I pretended and not pretend. Um, it's probably uh, no shock to anybody that this, um, this piece of legislation was never tested in the law courts, um, despite many of us who were um, identified as LGBTQ plus um, back then feeling and, and understanding from the law that if, um, if, our, if our, our sexual gender identity was revealed in the school workplace, now whether that was revealed through us coming out or, or more usually from us being outed, that we, you know, our, our position would be untenable and we would, we would lose our jobs. Um, Section 28 was never tested. Nobody ever lost their job as a consequence of, of Section 28, which says quite a bit, I think, about that that really nebulous wording. Um, I think it, it, it was very, very um, hard to, um, it, it was meaningless, quite honestly. Um, but, uh, and, and I think the vagueness of the wording contributed to this, it, it created a climate of fear for, for LGBT teachers and critically um, left those of us that were LGBTQ plus as teachers feeling completely and utterly um, unable to support young people who may, you know, come out to us or be struggling with their with their own sexual or gender identity. Um, you know, at I was a secondary school teacher at, at the most sort of critical time in their in in their adolescence, um, and you know, it it has left a legacy today. I, I think you know just because um, the legislation has moved on, we're all a product of the experiences that we had. And, you know, we carry internalized homophobia and shame and, and a certain degree of paralysis from that time. It really shaped who we are. Um, and certainly research that, um, that, that I did that um, appeared in the conversation actually, and um, I'm happy to, to share the link. I, I compared the experiences of, of um, LGBT teachers who had experienced Section 28 as teachers with those who'd only joined teaching after 2003 when Section 28 had been repealed. And there was a stark difference in the way in which they um, interpret, in, in their, in, they um, kind of experienced their work their school workplaces, they were far less likely to be out, this is the Section 28 teachers, far less likely to, to take a partner um, to a school function. And this was not back then, this was in 2019. Um, and you know, there were um, a staggering 64% of Section 28 teachers admitted to having a serious um, episode of anxiety or depression that had caused them to be absent from school linked to their sexual and gender identity and their role as a teacher. Brilliant, thank you, Catherine. Um, it strikes me that there's, there's quite a lot of relevance in thinking about Section 8 to some of the debates that are had today over how um, trans and non-binary children are, are treated in schools and how their particular needs are dealt with. Um, Meg John, I was just wondering if you thought there were any things that we could sort of apply from, from the Section 28 era in, in trying to kind of um, address that issue today and how, how we approach that. Absolutely. And I'm laughing because, um, like Catherine, I've also written a piece for the conversation and it was on exactly this <laughs> subject. <laughs> so back in, that, I <laughs> <laughs> no, back in 2017, I, I was writing about the trans moral panic um, and I think, you know, sort of named it as such. And obviously we've seen nothing like decrease ever since then in terms of the cultural kind of moral panic around trans. And yeah, you can see these real echoes in the sense of like, concerns about um you know the back in section 28 it was the book jenny lives with eric and martin i think that was really a concern of what if people had that in school and it promoted homosexuality and then sarah savage's book are you a boy or a girl um elicited a similar kind of panic i think again around back around in 2017 or so and there's this um i think liz trustee equalities minister at the time was saying under 18 should be protected from decisions they could make which may be irreversible in future about their gender so we see that protected you know a sense that we can't really 
teach kids about the diversity of possible gender experiences, identities and expressions, because there's this fear that somehow that will promote them to go towards something. Um, so there's, you know, clearly a kind of cis-normative framework going on, just as there was, there was and still is a heteronormative framework, right? Thank you. So Catherine, just to go back to you, I was just thinking as well, I know you've also written recently about the relevance to the debate um, that's being had in the US in several states in the US where similar style legislation has either been brought in or is coming in. I was just wondering if there's anything that you think that we can learn from the kind of the campaign against Section 28 and how it was eventually overturned here that is relevant to these debates today. I mean, I think I, these things these things take time. I mean, you're absolutely right. The uh, the, the legislation um, that that has been nicknamed in, in Florida the "Don't Say Gay" bill has um, more than a, a few echoes of, of section of section twenty eight. It is um, it, it, it's it's preventing teachers from talking about um, same same sex relationships in the in the curriculum. Um, it is. Um, it's ensuring that if if a if a young person wishes to speak about their 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 own sexuality or, or gender identity with a teacher, that the, the teacher needs to share that with the parents. Um, and you know, so it, 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 again, it is really stifling um, the 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 relationships and identities in, in schools. And you know, as we 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 see, um, you know. Ever number, ever growing number of, of, of sort of um, LGBT couples having having children. It's absolutely heartbreaking that you know young young children or, or, or pe you know people going through school will not see their families represented um, through the curriculum and 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 talked about in in school. And you know we role models. We one of the things we learned about Section Twenty Eight and. You know, I, I spend time now with with teachers and academics who were who were pupils during Section 28 and grew up with nobody to turn to. And, and you know, we we risk um, we risked exactly the same thing happening, you know, in in America. Um, you know, I, I was very I was very hopeful that when the um, the Conservatives were were replaced by uh, by New Labour in 1997, I think that Section 28 would be um, absolutely um, consigned to to the annals of history. But it actually took all the way until 2003, another six years um, for uh, it was slightly earlier. It's 2000 in uh, in Scotland, but it took until 2003 in um in england and you know what whatever the colors of the the government i think uh, parent power and parent views um across the spectrum are very compelling and and um there there is a, a slightly sort of insidious um kind of message within this that that somehow um teachers lgbtq plus teachers in particular are are, are not a, a good influence on on our young people it feels like we're talking about parent power there like the there's there's a kind of lesson there about how um widespread the the feeling of this um about this can be even if it to some people seems like a more kind of um niche or, or marginal interest in terms of people looking out from outside at the lgbt plus community um one one thing that, that i've always thought though is that um just to to start moving our discussion on a bit uh the, the kind of the opposite of that is uh has been the kind of achievement of marriage equality and the campaign um that uh, that was undertaken over many years to to reach that in this country and obviously others um, where it's been a real turnaround from a public perception a public point of view when there's the, you know it, it was kind of the uh, the legislation really catching up with that um, support for that in the end um, Adam I was just wondering what, what lessons can can be drawn from that very successful in many ways campaign yeah so um a great, great question. Um, and we've got to remember that the campaign, you know, the, the the journey to same sex marriage wasn't a straightforward one. It didn't go, it wasn't overnight from no no marriage to marriage. 
you know, we went through having civil partnership first. Apologies, my light has just gone off. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, and the, so it was it was a long a long road. So we, civil partnership was introduced in two thousand and five, which essentially gave same sex couples for the first time legal recognition for their relationships and the rights and responsibilities associated um, with marriage. And that was under a Labour government, but Labour were quite clear that they didn't consider it to be marriage. You know, that was the way they justified it. This isn't marriage, this is, um, you know, the rights and responsibilities, but this is something different. Um, and we saw that didn't last very long because I think they were completely out of touch with the general population. And I think once civil partnership was around, people, saw what they were doing. They couldn't see any difference in what people were doing when they were having a civil partnership to what their you know, heterosexual friends were doing when they were having a marriage. Um, it seemed exactly the same. Um, so I think, and I think through that, um, the British public began to be ahead of, ahead of government um, in terms of where they were, they were at with that. And I think that's why we then didn't have the resistance perhaps when we came to um, introducing same-sex marriage um, under the, the following um, coalition government. Um, interestingly, it was a it was done you know, via a political process of MPs vote, voting for it in this country. In other countries like Ireland, it was a it was a referendum. Um, we've had our own experiences of referendums, not always uh, as positive as that one. Um, but actually, I think I think in Ireland it was a real opportunity to, for the public to show their support as well. Whereas I think you know the the support was less, you know, it was more ambiguous what the public thought about it in the UK because it wasn't being directly voted for by the British um, the British public. But even then, during that campaign, you saw the resurgence of the kind of you know old homophobia. You know, the, you might remember there was a. A uh, campaign called the campaign F campaign for marriage. You know, it wasn't the campaign against same sex marriage. It was the campaign for marriage, um, and a lot lot of the things that the arguments that you, you saw in those campaigns were interestingly very similar to anti trans campaigns that we were seeing at the moment. You know, campaigns against the Gender Identity Recognition Act. I want to speak a bit more about that um, later, but there was a point I think you raised that I think is really interesting there, with this, this point about civil partnerships. Um, and it, for me, it raises a question about whether something like that, which is in many ways a, a compromise, um, is a good thing as a sort of stepping stone. I wonder if you've got any thoughts on that, Meg, John? Um, I'm going to say a slightly different thing, because I think the thing I really want to say about, I guess, all of the things we're talking about, and particularly this one, is I always try and ask, like, what did what did each of these changes open up, and also what did it close down? A related question, who did it include and who did it exclude? Because I think all these histories have um, this uneasy kind of sense of often more marginalized people being you know thrown under the bus is, is the phrase people use in order to get something from for often the more privileged and I think this one's quite a good example of that because a lot of the you know, a sort of part of queer history is, is this conversation about what should I be our agendas and the kind of fight for marriage and the fight um, to engage in the military are two that are often used as like well first of all like those are not the most important issues to the most marginalized where it's much more homeless first like mental health hate crime asylum you know and then also there's this big question of like should we be fighting to join institutions which we might actually question and in this case that quite a lot of like really creative and important like queer relational styles got kind of um submerged or excluded in the sense of like the, the one the thing we should want is coupledom and marriage and um again when you also look at it globally there's a real risk on both sides of the same-sex marriage debate you know one side was saying well, we mustn't do this because it will open the door to quote polygamy bestiality and paedophilia and the other side said oh no no don't worry it certainly won't open the door to polygamy bestiality and paedophilia as if all of these things are equivalent Right. And it's important to remember just how many countries globally have some kind of non monogamy as the norm in terms of relating. So, again, just just as we have such issues with people trying to gain um, asylum 
you know lgbtqia plus people and having to prove and it being easier again when there's like a marriage or a biological family tie you we, we should be kind of questioning the fact that some marriage and uh, biological family ties are the ones that are always privileged and people are given more rights um, and more capacity to come into different countries on the basis of those when particularly lots of queers the most important relationships may be friendship bonds and queer families of choice so that would be yeah I didn't answer your question but I answered a different question which I wanted to answer <laughs> but if I can if I can maybe that's my question yeah. to to that do you, do you think that there's a case though for engaging with those perhaps um, more heteronormative influenced issues as a mm. way of bringing public support for the broader movement in into play such that it might open up things for those um, mm. more marginalised uh, interests? Yeah, this is a question I was really addressing in um, the graphic guide I did called Queer Graphic History to look at like does yeah does this strategy work and it's it's really complicated like we can't predict it right yeah it might be a stepping stone to then we can in include more non-monogamous relationships or you know it opens the door in the way that people <laughs> were not wanting but to recognition of different kinds of relationships but it could equally be that it shuts that down and really you know sort of solidifies this idea that the couple and the nuclear family is the only way to do things and uh, you know moving on to the next one I think we're going to talk about the gender recognition act is a really good example where it's like oh this should be great for trans people right getting trans on the on the public agenda it's it's been a nightmare like so many trans people would say like we would rather and this is not all trans people I'm speaking for but you know a lot would say we would rather this never had come up because of the way this massive moral panic has gone around gender recognition act reform like in a way it would have been easier just to leave that as it was even though it's really problematic so you just never know when you know one of these moves towards legal recognition can have you know hu obviously hugely positive effects as the marriage equality did or when actually bringing these onto the public agenda could be extremely damaging and how on earth would you would you even predict right it's very difficult that's really interesting Catherine did you have any thoughts on this topic I, I mean as somebody who had a civil partnership as soon as uh, as soon as I was able, I, I found um, and, and my position has my, my personal position has changed on this over time. I, I felt um, initially quite quite grateful for the for the opportunity. Um, of course, it did in, it did entail me then returning to my own school workplace and and outing myself because my status had changed and just you know without just by by um by letting people know and you know on my on my school records um, that i was now in a civil partnership i was i was automatically outing myself i know circumstances have since changed and um when my partner and i um looked into some of our pension benefits um this through through civil partnership they that the pension benefits only became um, transferable from the point of the civil partnership, not from the point in which we had um, started our relationship, which was you know, a long time prior to the civil partnership. So there, there, there were there were huge problems um, with it. Um, but sometimes I believe we need to start from where the public are. Um, and take the public with them with with us and I think this was an I, I'm not sure we'd have gone from nothing to marriage and I, I do think it did um, for better or worse pardon the pun um, create a, a, a sort of a stepping stone um, towards marriage which has been been a, a really positive thing. That's really interesting and I think the, there's a point there from both what you were saying and what Meg John was saying about kind of be, being careful of kind of unintended consequences and, and unforeseen problems that might occur with something that initially seems like a good thing, essentially. Um, I just want to move on then to, to talk on uh, a bit more about some of the things that um, face the LGBT plus community today. Um, one of which in some ways seems like it's uh, very close to being a kind of a battle that's won, but 
also seems to have a lot of questions around it, and that's the, the issue of um, banning conversion therapy, because it seems very much like politicians are behind that as a broad idea, but what it might actually entail seems to be very open still. Um, Adam, is this, could you just perhaps just tell us a bit about the, the sort of current status of of that, um, uh, of that, that essentially, I guess, a campaign for rights there. What's what's going on with it? What what do people need to know about it right now? Yeah, I think you're right. The devil, the devil's in the detail. I think everybody, well, not everybody, but a lot of people are on board with the idea that conversion therapy is wrong, that it's unethical, that it doesn't work, that um, it's potentially harmful. Um, but then the question is, what do you do about it? And lots of countries around, you know. Well, an increasing number of countries are introducing legislation, but they differ quite substantially from one another um, from very comprehensive bans that will cover you no know, matter whether it's on children, adults in a religious context or a um, healthcare context to some that are a lot more um, cautious or limited and only applied to conversion therapy with children, only applied to conversion therapy in a healthcare context, don't cover you know, you know, religious settings, when we know that um, most conversion therapy appears to happen in re religious settings. So the, gov the government's um, own survey found that 51% of people who'd said they'd undergone conversion therapy had had it within a, a religious setting, compared to about I think it was about 18% or something like that um, in, a, in a healthcare setting. Um, and we know that m all of the major professional bodies are on board, um, mental health and psychological and therapeutic bodies are on board. They've signed a memorandum of understanding that conversion therapy is unethical and wrong. So then it's a question of how do you deal with all of that stuff that's going on elsewhere? Um, so in 2018, the, the government um, committed to ending conversion therapy, is how they put it, um, and then it's taken a while for them to come forward with, with their proposals, and I, I think that's possibly because they've realised it's slightly more complicated than they initially thought it might be, um, so they commissioned us to do some research um, for them, and then they took quite a while to publish their um their recommendations. So the, the current kind of state of play really is that their proposals, and these apply to England and Wales only, so it's a devolved matter, so Scotland are going to um, come up with their own proposals, but in England and Wales the proposals are to ban conversion therapy um, in terms of, um, so to introduce a new law that would apply to what they're calling talking conversion therapy, but this would apply to anybody under the age of 18, anybody who um, had not consented, so if it was overtly coercive, or if the person was unable to consent. Um, and they're saying that the consent process would need to be robust, um, which is you know, questionable. Um, they're also um, proposing to introduce um, make conversion therapy an aggravating kind of factor in violent um, crimes. So if somebody, for example, um, was to experience a violent crime as a way of trying to get them to change their sexual orientation or gender identity, that could be taken into consideration in sentencing. Um, and then there are also a, a number of other kind of a package of measures really in terms of support for victims, um, restricting the promotion of conversion therapies, um, banning people from being a trustee if they were found to, you know, are guilty of, of one of these offences. Also protection orders for children who are um, perhaps at risk of being taken overseas for conversion therapy. But there are a lot of questions around, you know, the key issues around consent. Can it ever be consensual? Um, you know, drawing the line at 18 over, um, and also where, ha, to what extent this will apply to religious contexts as well, because the government has been clear that, you know, they, they won't, um, this won't affect normal religious practices, but then that raises the, you know, the question of what's a normal religious practice and what's a conversion therapy religious practice. So many questions there that I think, You've, you've really had, uh, you've you know really nicely summarised the sort of complexity of that issue. Um, Meg John, I was just wondering if you thought there was any way 
um, that kind of LGBT campaigners and the movement will generally can kind of try to cut through some of the complexity in issues like this. Also something like you know, gender self-identification where it's a really, really difficult debate for a lot of people to have. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of my my thing is to try and simplify some of this stuff because I'm writing, you know, generally comics and self help guides that try and kind of, but it is it is complicated. Like, um, um, you know, to re to really get at what's what's going on in the conversion therapy ban. I mean, the other thing that um, Adam's um, sort of response with the British Psychological Society really nicely highlights is this kind of trying to be this false equivalence here between trying to convert someone from a norm a non-normative sexuality or gender to a normative one and vice versa if it's, as if that's equivalent you know um, so there's a real danger here that people who want to do affirming therapy for LGBTQIA plus people just to help them understand what range of options is available to them and open up that possibility and really affirm that if they are moving in that direction that's okay it's it's, there's a risk that they're going to get targeted under this conversion therapy ban for doing what's actually really affirmative um, therapy and I've written a document for the British Association of Counselling and Psychotherapy on this kind of issue on gender sex relationship diversity um, which might be helpful if people want to find out more but yes to try and to try and explain to people why that's not equivalent you know means we've got to get into issues of kind of power and social structures and systems and again people haven't necessarily already got their head around those things and in my work, I'm, I'm really one of my main points is to try and show folks that it's these these aren't just individual kind of agency questions. Oh, if somebody, you know, like as Adam was saying, if someone just consents to it, surely it's fine. Well, how much agency do we really have to consent when we're living in a very heteronormative culture, when there's a trans moral panic going on if we're a trans person or a gender diverse person? Um, and often these legislations kind of assume this if you're under the age of 18 you have no agency and you can't possibly consent to anything and as soon as you hit 18 we see it in the you know relationships and sex education stuff we see it in the, the trans stuff and and here that as soon as you hit 18 suddenly there's no pressures on you and you can completely you're completely free to choose and we really need to question and see that we're, we're always all of us kind of under these different pressures and also under our, our histories like living through section 28 as, as Catherine rightly said it sounds like it's something we just people need to watch out for is that kind of like you're saying false equivalence or, or kind of creating bogeyman and bogeyman yes. that kind of thing and and i you, it feels like you definitely see that in the debate about self-identification that mm -hmm. it, all sorts of issues are raised that the that throw that just try to throw negative light on the people whose lives it most affects without necessarily engaging with the issue directly yeah, and it's having a devastating toll. I mean, the number of young people who are feeling at all able to go near to, you know, embracing their gender now, um, who are very frightened of being completely thrown out of homes, and also the suicide rates, rates of hate crime and mental health problems are all just skyrocketed in this time. So it's, there's a genuine massive impact of these things. Um, so, you know, again, as I said, like gender self-identification would be great, but what's actually happened is that that debate towards that it started in this consultation that was happening back in 2016, 17, and it's just gone on and on with sort of like, oh yeah, we are going to do it. Oh no, we're not. Oh, maybe we are. Now it's up for debate again, you know, in the coming months, I think, you know, and it's as, as long as this drags on um, and then media are just, there's just, you know, this real kind of like, I don't know, it feels to me so similar to like the way marginalized people are so often scapegoated. It's like, we, you know, people in the positions of power don't want people looking too carefully at them. So we'll say, you know, trans people are the root of all evil or immigrants are the root of all evil or whichever kind of marginalized group. Um, and, you know, the media seems to really whip this up. Um, it also it's also similar to a lot of the way the media depicts feminism like they really like to depict a kind of war between competing feminist factions again to get to sort of <laughs> well the impact is to get feminists fighting each other rather than fighting the patriarchy which would be a lot better use of everyone's time you know so um yeah I think it's 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 a whole mess of different factors that come together um but unfortunately the toll it takes is you know is biggest on trans people and it's biggest on the most marginalized trans people particularly trans women of color who are the ones that experiences the most high level of violence thank you um catherine come back to you obviously your expertise is in education 
Um, and we've talked a bit about um, how kind of some trans issues are are are, are, are really at play uh, for um, young people who who might be uh, who whose schools might not be sure how to or how they can best help them or or what they need to do. Um, where does kind of sex and relationships education need to go now? What's the what's the what should be the kind of the aim for um, the LGBT plus community with that regards? I mean, I, I think I think there is an opportunity with with relationships and sex um, in, in sex education, um, I, but almost almost before teachers can get there, I think there is a huge um, training and education piece to do with them. Um, I think that you know we we were all aware that that prior to the pandemic there was a groundswell of concern about the. Um, the LGBTQ plus inclusive relationships and sex education. We saw the, the, the parental protests in, uh, in Birmingham and in other major cities and, uh, the, and, and the pandemic arrived. And, uh, and I, I, guess, I guess everyone um, looked, looked in a different direction and, and, and it, you know, it was introduced with, without, without much sort of um, fuss or, or, or fanfare. Um, but I think because of, you know, I, I, I know that training, that, that, that sort of um, trans inclusive training providers have, have not been able to get into schools and work with teachers and, and, and people that support young people um, as they might have done uh, prior to the, the, the pandemic. And I think there really is a piece to do um, there that, that helps those um, professionals that, that work with our trans and non-binary young people to, to, to catch up and, 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 you know, get up to speed. And um, I'm, I'm you know, really quite, quite concerned about, you know, about that. Um, I think we're a couple of years in now to relationships and sex education. And um, despite, despite all the, um, and, and Meg John's phrase of moral panic is, is absolutely the right one for that as well. That, that, that concern and moral panic, it, it, it seems to to be um, you know, not not the, the great evil that that, um, that that everybody worried it would be. Um, and you know, I I was I met with a, an academic yesterday, and we were talking about a, an evaluation piece that we feel that needs to be done. Um, you know, a couple of years in to see to see how um, relationships and sex education is 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 faring. Thank you. Um, continuing to, to look to the, the future then, um, Adam, what do you think um, either is next or should be next perhaps for um, the campaign for LGBT rights in general? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Well, I, I would say that I don't think we're finished yet with conversion therapy ban I think that's still something that's going to be brought to a parliament be debated when we see what the final bill is going to look like um and I think the campaigning is going to carry on around that and even beyond a bill I think you know as with all of these things as we've talked about you know just removing section 28 didn't automatically create inclusive education having civil partnership did not you know create equality and the likelihood is that this bill um, is going to need reform later on, probably. Um, and these things, as we were talking about, tend to be incremental. You know, we'll probably look back at the first bill as a kind of stepping stone to what we end up with later on. Um, so I think that is is one thing. Um, and I, th I think they're interconnected as well, because I think inclusive education is really important. You know, a, 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 a ban on conversion therapy isn't going to stop conversion therapy in itself. It's a very blunt instrument. You know, what we need is, um, you know, and when, when I spoke to victims of conversion therapy and asked them what they thought needed to be done to stop conversion therapy, the, the number one thing they said was more inclusive education, because they said, if I'd have had good education on sexual orientation and gender identity, I wouldn't have just taken what this person said to me, you know, as on, on faith that, you know, that was accurate and gone down that, that, that line. So I think um, inclusive education is one, key thing that we're going to need to sort out to, to solve the problem. Um, 
But in terms of other kind of areas, I think um, we've already kind of talked a bit about the Gender Recognition Act. But again, I think that's something that's going to continue to um, be a key issue going forward and also um, recognition of non-binary persons and, and things like that. And Meg, John, I know that's something you think is particularly important, get some attention. Well, it, it, yeah, but it's up for debate. Um, for the petition um, to make non-binary illegally recognised gender is up for debate after the sort of self-identification um, stuff has gone through. And obviously they're quite related at the moment. The proposals with Gender Recognition Act reform don't include the potential to identify as non-binary, but again, my you know, as a non-binary person, obviously, I would like to be recognised in my gender, and I currently can't be. Um, and many countries uh, worldwide do recognise non-binary people um, in that way. But my fear is that it will just reignite this panic um, in more and more. And you know, the last thing that vulnerable non-binary people who are trying to survive through a pandemic and wartime <laughs> really need is, you know, to, to have a massive debate about whether we exist or not. Um, so, you know, so it comes back to that. Um, I think we really need to think about, again, who gets included and who gets excluded. You know, it's really telling. I think that the conversion therapy, you know, really focuses on sort of gay people being convert tried to be converted to straight and to some extent trans to cis but there's there's very little about asexual people in there and actually quite mainstream sex therapy still tries to insist that being sexual is a normal healthy part of being human which is you know in a way conversion therapy trying to convert asexual people to be sexual and can even lead to you know really non-consensual sex happening um, and, and intersex people get nowhere in any of these debates and for intersex people there are non-consensual surgeries happening on infants you know in the mainstream medical profession to try and bring them in line you know so some of them medically necessary but there are many surgeries that happen that are not med medically necessary and it feels like the intersex agenda is just nowhere like in terms of public conversation or conversation legal conversation so I think, you know, those things really need to be in there. And I also think we just need to start thinking much more intersectionally about this. Again, what's hitting the most marginalized people across the board, not just LGBTQIA plus um, people and, and how do our, how, how is the kind of, um, we need to get solidarity between, I think, issues around like homelessness and who gets to have a home, who has to pay extortionist rents and who doesn't, you know, impacts at queer community because it's very, very hard for queer adults to get to live together. Um, you know, that the, the all those sort of legislations are so set up for kind of nuclear families, biological families and marriage bonds. Um, and again, we really need to look at asylum, right, because we know that about uh, one in three kind of LGBT plus asylum cases gets uh, dis believed by the officials and rejected so um, and that's you know obviously issues around asylum they're just only going to increase in terms of climate crisis and also um, the war that's happening yeah um, that's great. great thank you very much um Catherine we, we talked a bit earlier about the um kind of the relevance of the section 28 debate to what's happening in the US um and the rights that are kind of under attack there do you think, uh, are there any areas where you feel like that there may also be a kind of a threat for things going backwards in this country? Certainly the work that I, the leadership development work I do with um, LGBTQ teachers and, you know, con concerns me that um, despite us being, it'll be 20 years next year since the repeal of, of section 28, Many of them don't have the, the the space or opportunity to 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 speak their identities into existence in the school workplace, um, and you know we we associate the um, the don't ask don't tell with the Clinton administration and the um, that that turning a blind eye to, um, to to lesbian and gay serving officers in the in the military and and again something that that looked at face value as a as an act of generosity or, or tolerance back in the day. But I, I, I see don't ask, don't tell um, in, in action in schools up and down our country where um, nobody, nobody asks about anybody's weekend in the, in the staff room. Um, 
nobody asks those questions. Nobody asks about who their partner is. Um, and people, yeah, they want, you know, LGBT teachers that respects their privacy, but they don't get the chance to be their authentic selves in the workplace. And, you know, I, I, I do think that um, when, when, we, when we allow people, when we give people the space, partic particularly in the workplace, to, to be their authentic selves, it gives other people permission to be authentic. And, you know, when, when the swan is gliding and the, the, the legs are not going like crazy, um, people are so much more effective. You know, teaching is a really, really challenging job and it takes everybody's energy, 100% of their energy. And if 50% of your energy is managing your LGBT identity and, you know, worried about what, what colleagues think or what parents might say, then, then you, you can't be your brilliant best. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel much is made about, you know, competing protected characteristics, but I, I believe very strongly that, you know, no, nobody has the right to tell another person who they can be and how to live their lives, you know, as long as they are behaving within, within the law. Um, and I, I think we're a long way from that. Um, because of the sort of the heteronormative and cisnormative kind of environments that, that we've, we've already rehearsed here with regards to, to schools in particular. Thank you. Um, I'm just uh, looking at the time and also the fact that we've got lots of questions that have come in. So what I might try and do now is just um, fire through a few of them. And if anyone wants, if our panel just wants to kind of shout out or raise their hand or whatever, if they if they have a, one to answer, then, then I'd love them to do that. Um, so we've got a, a question from Marissa Dainton, who says, I think the parallels being drawn between the Section 28 debate and the current and burgeoning trans moral panic are frightening. I'd be interested to know what degree the panel might be the current panic about trans identities as the canary in the coal mine, the potential reawakening of anti-LGB panics in the UK. Nodding. Meg, John, did you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I, th I think it is worth being really uh, mindful of that. And I, I would just say Judith Butler wrote a really good piece, I think, in The Guardian quite recently talking about the much wider context of kind of anti-LGBT feeling and, and exactly sort of suggesting this was the case, I think. Yeah, I've certainly noticed that people who express transphobic views very often have seem tend to have expressed biphobic views as well. Um, anything that kind of uh, challenges the, the kind of the set parameters of the belief of society seems to have a lot of relation and it seems to easily sort of jump from one to the other. Um, I've run through some more questions as we've got so many. Um, how can we create, this is from, sorry, this is from Nicole Klinger. How can we create a culture where LGBTQIA will feel like they can be themselves in the workplace and in a school setting? I mean, this sort of follows on from what you were just saying, Catherine. What do you think can actually be done to make people feel like they can be themselves, I, I think it. I think it starts with it starts with role models. It starts with it starts with leadership. Um, I think when when um, in in schools when when you have um, a, a, an LGBTQ plus um, school leader, um, they. They, they give they give everybody permission to be their authentic selves as, as well. Um, we there we create role models for young people. We 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 do not have that um, dare I say um, Western pale male and stale depiction of what a head teacher looks like. And people people need to to see um, see diverse role models to um, to have the permission to to, to be themselves and uh, I, that's where we absolutely need to start and hence the um, the courageous leaders program that that we uh, that we run across the UK you now we've helped some 78 um, teachers um, achieve leadership roles and uh, thinking back to my my own experiences and, and the absence of, of role models of, of LGBT role models at all in schools during section 28 you know that makes me feel that there is um, 
that, that there is a, a lemonade moment in, uh, in spite of the, the lemons through section 28. Um, question from Valio Khan Snyder. For individuals and associations advocating against harmful anti LGBTQIA plus legislation, what advice would you offer? Um, Adam, uh, have you got any thoughts on that? Sorry, what, which question was that? Yeah, so, uh, just for, for, for individuals and associations who want to advocate against harmful legislation, what, what advice would you offer based on kind of what you know and what you've learned from um, studying campaigns in the past? Well, I think it comes back to Catherine's point about showing leadership, doesn't it? And, you know, being a, a visible and a vocal ally, really, to the LGBT community. Um, I mean, I, I, I kind of wanted to build on what Catherine said, because I think actually, you know, um, conversion therapy is the extreme version of what happens if you're not free to be yourself and people are driven to that because of the pe the culture and um, that they find themselves in and often due to people in positions of authority whether that be religious leaders or whether that be their parents who make them feel that they can't be themselves um so you know, I think, but I think it's, 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 the, it's a culture thing. So I think your employers as well, you know, being a, a vocal ally of, and, um, you know, making sure that it's clear that discrimination is not welcome in that, in that environment and that inclusion and diversity is celebrated are kind of the key things, I would say. I'd just also say, I think it can be really helpful to try and expand out this because often we're focusing on like, how do we make things better for a marginalized group? But something I try and do in my work is often say that the things that are bad for the marginalized group is actually bad for everything, everyone. Like I know they found in some cases when they addressed like toilet cubicles for trans people in schools um, and brought in single cubicles, suddenly the rates of bullying against um, cisgender boys went down because a lot of that was happening in these shared, you know, toilet spaces, right? And I think there's a lot of examples like that, this sort of rigid kind of binary gender we know is incredibly bad for like you know the, the, the suicide rate in men is, is really related to trying to conform to that masculinity um you know the lack of any wage for women who care in the home and the um, again mental health problems amongst women have been related to you know this stark kind of gender division that we have so and it, it would be great if people instead of sort of trying to divide these out in this way of like maybe if the marginalized group gets more rights the rights are going to go down for other groups you know instead of that it's like how can we all kind of come together on this and say well you know the, these rigid gender roles are really hurting everyone this idea that you know um you know the idea the small ideas around sexuality are hurting everybody everybody could really benefit from rse in schools you know yeah i heard somebody recently say you know being an ally isn't about you know doing something nice for that group, marginalized group over there actually it's about you know all of these things indirectly impact well they directly impact some people more than others but they indirectly affect all of us it's a really good point Catherine did you have any uh, thoughts perhaps on that question before perhaps we close I, I I mean for me I think um you know I I I really don't don't like it when we when we talk about um our LGBT community around a sort of victim narrative. I, I believe um, strongly that the experiences um, that 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 many of uh, of us have as of, as LGBT Q plus people actually give us um, some experiences and some skills that are really really useful. Um, whether that's um, being able to read people quite well and you know make a judgment about whether it's safe or not to to, to come out um, to I think we are often we know what it's like to feel othered and to feel marginalized and so we're the first to to sort of put our arms around other people or notice other people that may well feel that for whatever reason they they don't fit in either at school or you know in the workplace um, you know we're we're great at managing lots of stress and lots of turmoil you know what do I say to this person how much do I share how do I introduce myself 
and and we're you know we we we're very very good at presenting an air of calm when there's uh, when there's all this sort of noise going on in the in the background. So I, I think you know I'd like to see us um, flip some of those perhaps um, you know not ideal experiences and say what can we learn from them and how can we turn them into a positive and actually be great leaders or great role models as as a consequence of that. You know we. Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot we've got to offer through the experiences that we've, that we've had. Thank you. That's a really fantastic positive note to end on today. Um, uh, this has been a really fascinating discussion. Um, uh, thank you to all three of you. It's been, it's been really interesting, just from my point of view as the chair, but I can see from the, the comments that we're getting as well um in in the chat that this has um, been really appreciated and really enjoyed by our uh, uh, the audience today as well so thank you very much uh, I'll, I'll hand back over to Sahar thanks Stephen and yeah I just wanted to say thank you to everyone I was so excited to organize this or be part of supporting with this and I'm so happy we've had it um, just to say as well a recording of this will be available in the next few days and it will obviously be um, promoted as well and yeah just to thank everyone and hope everyone enjoyed as well <laughs>